cienījamie apaļā galda dalībnieki. Here participants of their own table. I believe that in fact we have created a very good bridge to experts discussion. Uh, probably several of you participated in the previous part and in our conversation about what the progress was and how uh, have we succeeded in the implementation of the rule of law. This bridge was uh, showed uh, to us very well by uh, the federal prosecutor Amit Kamravala, who spoke before who said that any steps in strengthening the power and the rule of law is essential if the society and the inhabitants really believe that the rule of law is working. And he noted that we have a very good legal framework in Latvia. He uh, in particular mentioned regulation in the criminal procedure which fully complies with the standards of Europe and can be used as good example how to regulate these matters also in the international level. But of course, one question we have to ask whether this framework works every day and whether it allows Latvian society every day to believe that the rule of law in Latvia is really strong, that it is the main framework uh, working in the country. Since uh, we have huge interest about uh, this roundtable discussion, we have a lot of speakers, we have a lot of important issues to discuss, because like we said, in a way, we are measuring uh, our progress uh, in the last couple of years, in the last year, from previous uh, meeting in February, where uh, we uh, discussed uh, the problems and uh, today mentioned uh, uh, some details and possible solutions or, or problems. But in order to involve our audience and to make everyone able to participate, initially, I would request all of you to answer to the question that really addressed uh, what uh, Mr. Cabravola said, that the society needs to believe in the rule of law. Now, I would ask you all to take your smartphones and to go to the web page, sli.do, to write a username, Dalna, and answer the question there we have decided to ask what should happen for the society to believe that in Latvia we have progressed in our fight against corruption. So how, what to do for society to see that the rule of law works, that we have fair justice, we have fair uh, accusation, fair defense. Uh, so what should Happen. So we go to slido.com, username Dalna, and uh, with one word, uh, uh, let's answer the question. And I hope that we can immediately share our screen and, sc and see on the screen our uh, short reactions in the one word to this very, very important question. I see that um, everything works. Uh, I would like Abnia to uh, share the screen so we all uh, could see this important precondition. Um, um, so, let's give us all one or two more minutes, and then let's see which is the common opinion, the most significant opinion, emphasis on which is... Uh, 
These questions are discussed very often in public discourse concerning the strengths of the rule of law or power of the rule of law in Latvia. So unanimously we speak about verdicts and that would be a very important signal to the society that the rule of law exists that people who are involved in criminal offenses uh, really receive according punishment and that the rule of law is working and law enforcement system is dealing uh, with these uh, crimes uh, fairly the tendency actually is very uh, clear we all talk about verdicts and uh, to a big extent it is also obviously uh, public demand in media discourse in public discussions and that is to a great extent related with the questions we already discussed and mentioned as problems already in our uh, February meeting uh, discussion why uh, Latvian society is rather skeptical about the capacity of public administration to fight corruption and uh, corruption crimes. We still see that there are um, some only verdicts uh, when they are really evaluated for the society to receive this signal yes we have very good uh, legislative framework uh, we have strategies uh, how to strengthen the rule of law however a uh, crucial are verdicts for the society to believe to trust so let's start with our uh, discussion like I said, we have uh, several panelists, and I will introduce with these panelists uh, when I give floor to him or her to save the time. So now I will give the floor to um, Mr. Yuris Ransons, Chair of the Parliament Committee on Defense, Internal Affairs and Corruption Prevention at the Latvian Parliament, Simon. So uh, actually, he has a key to delegated supervision of the society. His duty is see all this process in totality to come to these verdicts, uh, to what we agreed uh, that could serve as an important signal to the society. Mr. Ransons, can we talk about the significant progress in this field in the last uh, half year? Yes, uh, thank you for the floor. The last half year is actually too short period for us to talk about a significant progress because we, we, each of us understands probably directly what uh, significant progress means. But in general, looking at the situation, I would like to say that these verdicts, they do emerge uh, more often than before, but the main challenge why uh, we didn't have so often verdicts before, but I would say uh, starting from uh, regaining our independence, so in a longer period of time when we can see those trends more clearly, because it is very difficult to assess what has been planned just a couple of days ago, so to say. But really, the awareness about uh, combating and prevention of corruption has increased significantly, has increased uh, investigation uh, process and rendering of verdicts. Uh, right now, we have a lot of uh, verdicts and judgments that are uh, disputable by the society. We have actually one of the highest requirements for proof in Europe. So when working on those requirements of proof and uh, uh, the requirements for quality of proof and uh, which evidence and which proof is permissible or not, uh, the results in a good verdict or bad verdict. Uh, 
and uh, uh, but that that is satisfying the expectancies of the society. Um, uh, difficult to say. Uh, we see some uh, information in the TV about the big corruption scandal, and of course we understand how mass media works. They fight for uh, their audience. And sometimes they uh, overreact to the significance of the case, of the event, of the proof. So then finally we receive big expectations from the society to prove that there has been a crime. But when it comes to actual proving, then we face uh, problems. Uh, like uh, the court uh, does not consider this uh, set of evidence sufficient to uh, render a verdict. But in general, I would say that uh, the sentencing has improved and understanding of judges uh, what should be considered as an evidence or proof or whatnot has increased as well. If we look at the uh, verdicts and judgments 20 years ago, these were always very uh, disputable concerning how evidence was evaluated and taken into consideration. I am optimist and seeing how this uh, corruption risk uh, evaluation system is being developed and implemented in every institution. Uh, there are some uh, four or five control mechanisms implemented. The supervising prosecutor, even higher rank prosecutor, So um, it's even uh, sometimes not uh, not uh, it's not so bad. I would say we have progress in total. Uh, we have really achieved much more in a shorter period of time uh, now than before in the past. Legislator has always been uh, ready to come forward. So that would be general assessment of me where we are today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ransen. Since we are in the discussion mode, I will ask you additional question concerning the burden of proof. Is that a practice or we could still make some amendments in the law to decrease this unproportionate burden of proof and the second question is about uh, mass media sometimes you say you said that they sometimes may overreact but at the same time they are uh, performing function of a watchdog like us not to forget about these issues and it is very important so where would you set the line uh, between this very useful watchful uh, function the mass media is performing and scandalous function. Yes, the first question, uh, the burden of proof, sufficiency of, of uh, proof, uh, our understanding has changed. I would um, say one example, which always was a problem in corruption cases very often uh, so we have court sessions audio recorded and video recorded and uh, sometimes within framework of investigation or operative uh, uh, example uh, the bribe is given uh, and taken by official then uh, we uh, hear such a disputes so in video recording we do not hear what this bribe was about, uh, but in audio recording, we don't see who was involved and then what was the amount. And so it uh, sometimes seems that it's a, a too detailed assessment and that was a challenge. Right now, the situation is slightly changing. 
And now these verdicts are uh, being made on internal, based on internal belief. And if we see obvious situation, then we shouldn't go into detailed defense tactics and try to uh, do everything possible to say no, not guilty. And uh, about mass media, uh, I just wanted to indicate uh, to the fact uh, that that due to them, uh, there are two big expectations from the society when seeing something on the TV. And that's when they when mass media fight for the audience for the market, they just uh, overreact, they thicken their titles, they sort of promise more than really is there. However, I have noticed a good practice that all institutions when commenting on uh, these uh, events, uh, they say we cannot say guilty or uh, not guilty, uh, there is a presumption of innocence, and, and of course, yes, mass media has to perform its watchdog function and it's very good in a way. And uh, they play a big positive role in uh, preventing officials of, from uh, bribe taking, uh, from corruption. And uh, the last, uh, what we can mention, like why uh, ministers are losing their positions, that is um, cases related with a lot of passes. So we cannot do anything about the expectations of the society, but we are growing as a society. Uh, after some five years, maybe more, we will come close to le levels and understandings of Scandinavian countries by the officials, by the society. That is my evaluation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ransons. Also for other speakers, I will ask to keep in mind what Mr. Ransons said that concerning the burden of proof, the understanding should be there that something is obvious that you should look at the evidence on the essence on the merits so please next speakers when you want to add something to this then give your uh, opinion on this uh, mr ansens you throwed a very good bridge to the next speaker and uh, you mentioned the law on the conflict of interest in the activities of officials, and that is a really very, very important anti-corruption uh, legislation uh, cornerstone. And of course, the commissions of public authorities and local governments work with this law and other laws related with anti-corruption law. Now I would give the floor to Mrs. Goldberg to give her vision to what has been heard and said, please, the floor is Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the floor uh, for the opportunity to speak to you. I do. I cannot call myself a great expert in this area, but judging by my experience uh, from uh, from the time that I worked for a municipality before the parliament, uh, that's when we started to develop the first anti-corruption plan, and we organized seminars for employees. And I believe this is where the experience is uh, is uh, accumulated. Yes, and uh, being um, the chair of the public administration and local government committee, I think we mostly, uh, most often have spoken about how to prevent conflicts of interest in uh, whatever the civil servants do. Uh, if we speak about the law, the law uh, has been in effect uh, for quite a while, and if I count it correctly, we have had 33 amendments. And every time when we return uh, to 
uh, amending this law, we invite the responsible bodies and say, you know, now it's the time. Now you have to make sure that this law is as it is, as it should be, and maybe it's time in for a new law. Why? Uh, we have been amending and, and improving this law for some time uh, to um, curtail specific practices or uh, as maybe to create exemptions for some groups or maybe to create more favorable conditions for some groups. I think that all of this has resulted in the sense of unfairness in the public. And every time when we have discussions about this law, um, this is what uh, those who participate in these meetings almost always conclude, that there is this sense of unfairness. One of the greatest problems that we have is that we maybe do not really uh, have these very clear and understandable rules, and I'm speaking about laws, about normative acts, about guidelines, plans. We have lots of these documents. And I believe that this is used by various groups of officials uh, in a dual way. For me, I have this, uh, I have two groups. Uh, there are people who are responsible, who are maybe uh, more uh, afraid of various violation, very, uh, violations. And these are people maybe who are not so prone to um, commit any breaches. But they uh, maybe are so afraid of not uh, of missing some norm or maybe violating some rule, and in fear of that, they do not do anything. And I think this closely relates uh, to even paralyzing active action in specific areas, in many areas. People don't want to take responsibilities. They don't want to make decisions. And if no decisions are made, nothing happens, nothing progresses. And then there are officials uh, who are high ranking officials, uh, of course, not all, but many who make significant important decisions, they quite often use this chaos, this uncertainty. Mm. They uh, sometimes uh, misuse resources or sometimes abuse their power and they are not, uh, they are not uh, persecuted for this. Uh, they are not uh, punished for this due to this uncertainty. Uh, also in discussions with colleagues about uh, corruption, uh, I think uh, CNAB is mostly interested in these issues as well as NGOs. So these amendments to the law, these, they are mostly considered from these two points of view. We can also speak about the fact that uh, people uh, tend to develop these feelings, uh, feelings, and you mentioned mass media, that they punishment uh, is applied mostly to lesser officials and not uh, for maybe so much deliberate violations, but some things that maybe they have missed or, or not noticed. Of course, I can provide many examples, but if we speak about the general situation, I think this really causes such internal fear or sense of injustice in people. Uh, in the context of not making decisions. And not only this sense of just injustice, not only in relation to those who have applied these punishments or penalties, but also mm, the country in general. And, and I have met people who have been uh, so hurt that it takes them a long time to overcome that. Of course, we can also speak about high level cases, uh, uh, significant violations, uh, unacceptable violation. Quite often, these high-ranking uh, officials do not get punished. And even if they get punished, then this moment from this very public, for example, the, the ten, uh, arrest uh, until the very final uh, decision, uh, court decision, it, this period is so long that people do not see this link. Another aspect that I wanted to mention 
uh, very often we speak about the responsibility of various officials, but we very little speak about the second side or the other side, because there are two parties in this process. And in this discussion, I think it was very important to invite representatives from uh, business associations. There are many examples to this as well, but at the end, uh, yes, I may have mentioned mistakes, and, and uh, but uh, I would also like to uh, mention some other aspects that, in my opinion, are important. First, a clear, unambiguous, and just a normative act that do not keep changing all the time. And finally, maybe we have to prepare a new law. Uh, a new law on the prevention of conflicts of interest in uh, what in uh, civil service awareness raising activities uh, also are very important in my opinion and i think here ngos play a great role and i think they do that very well also openness transparency uh, this was a very topical issue at the beginning of this uh, summer, in particular in the context of uh, university councils. Sometimes this is considered like a punishment, you know, you have to reveal everything about yourself. It's like an, something like a burden for you, but this is a totally uh, incorrect approach because people should not be afraid. And I think uh, a mistake might, may have been made at the very beginning, and we will need efforts to overcome this force. I also heard about many plans, and it's good that the organizations uh, prepare these plans and deadlines and so on. But I think uh, the plan is not the main ultimate achievement. The ultimate achievement is whether the plan is implemented and this is a very difficult area for us as a country in general and also on specific levels. So the main thing is how we implement the plan. These are my considerations about the situation and about what we do in our committee. Yeah, that seems good. Uh, Leo Stadius, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goldberg, for the very clear uh, explanation uh, of the problems uh, and, and the guiding, guiding problem or the guiding issue of our discussion, like plans, strategies, legal framework and how people see the justice in practice. Yes, uh, the justice is included in the laws, but in the practice, people do not see that. As a chair of the parliamentary committee, I believe you also have a very important supervisory function alongside le the legislative work. And if we speak about plans, what kind of cooperation you have with CNAM in helping them maybe to... Uh, have a broader look at uh, whatever they do, for example, introduction of anti-corruption plans. So how do you cooperate from the supervisory point of view, and not only with SNA, but also the state revenue service, for example, uh, where the official uh, income declarations are submitted, which is also an important anti-corruption measure. Uh, yes, we have this cooperation when we discuss uh, specific draft laws during committee meetings. What concerns CNAB, I think these are people who are very qualified, very active, and I can really praise their enthusiasm and, and ability to work in this area. But to a great extent, uh, CNAB uh, Im implements or ensures this control function over implementation of the law. But if we speak about general policy and policy making about which I spoke, I think here we have to um, place a greater focus on the state chancery 
and I believe that they have uh, not been really uh, active enough in this regard. We have invited them several times to be more active. And as far as I know, they have been meeting uh, with them uh, at the request of the committee. And the same applies to the state revenue service. Yes, they implement their uh, particular functions, but there is no general view no general picture and the committee has invited to adopt such a picture as the results uh, it's difficult to say but i think we should include those in the new draft laws that i just mentioned thank you as you were quite positive about the ngos uh, uh, what concerns uh, anti-corruption matters Maybe Dalna can say something here. You have really taken on the initiative to coordinate these activities, for example, with the state revenue service and the state chancery. Sometimes this really is a problem that one body doesn't speak with the other body and we need the parliament to intervene to ensure this cooperation and discussion. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ms. Goldberger. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Duritis. You are also a member of the parliament, but also the parliamentary secretary of the Ministry of Health. So this is really a key sector if we speak about the pandemics and, and so on. What is your opinion about this fundamental um, fundamental justice? Yes, we have many things in the law and these are right things and we have strategies and so on. But this understanding of the fundamental justice, it's not really rooted into our society. Uh, thank you for the floor, uh, dear participants of the discussion. I uh, am happy to be here and I would like to say that, yes, I am also not uh, expert in uh, issues of law, issues of uh, combustion of uh, corruption, but uh, it's more like my personal view, my personal vision uh as a person who has been in different uh, processes when managing different institutions and being in the parliament right now uh, in the field of uh, medicine uh, in the field of higher education and so so i would like to say that uh, and also listening to our experts um, we have uh, some particular risk that uh, we look at these uh, issues of corruption prevention or conflict of interest are, uh, are uh, formalizing somehow them. We need different plans, uh, different guidelines and algorithms uh, how to act. However, I would like to say that uh, uh, the most important and decisive is uh, the fact uh, how much we succeed in the nearest future to attract uh, honor people, employees, officials in all the sectors and institutions that live on the state budget and i guess you would agree with me that uh, we can write uh, the best plans uh, whatsoever but if in this particular institution uh, the management or the head or uh, employees are not honored uh, we will have these scandals. I'm not saying that we do not need plans, but I would like to pay attention of the participants of the discussion that we really are good in formally writing plans. But like uh, Mr. Mrs. Goldberg said before, the most important question is whether we implement these plans. These plans should be more simple, more realistic to be implemented. And that is one question, which of course includes in itself the next question about 
attraction of state officials. And that, uh, and I would like to emphasize, like now, it is a question of remuneration uh, of assessment. That's why I am happy that we are again discussing the law on single uh, remuneration, because the question is, what is the motivation of a person to take up position of state official? And that is very important. And that is also why we do not succeed to uh, attract the best people. I guess this problem, we are, we are not the only country facing this problem. Also other countries have similar problems. Uh, conflict of interest. I would say that CNAB is following very, very carefully these conflicts of interest concerning the higher ranking officials in, in particular, and that is the correct way to do that. But seeing the real situation in the sector, I would like to say that in different uh, areas and fields and sectors in particular, where there is big contribution of state budget, this conflict of interest on the merits uh, is not evaluated, is not prevented to many aspects. Of course, according to the law, that is a duty of uh, the managers or the heads, but we have people who are not officials and they are very influential and they uh, do not have anything and they do not have to be officials according to the law, but they have big influence on the pro on any process. So we cannot just rely uh, that uh, in some future uh, our honesty and integrity will increase and we will all start reporting, preventing and so, but no, we really should pay very much attention to those sectors where the state budgeting, uh, state budget financing is very high. And we have to look at those cases where those conflicts of interest are and maybe exist already for 10 years. Uh, and they are able to survive because of existing regulation. And just because of these cases, a lot of important things are not happening. And finally, about uh, the trust belief, uh, the question of speed is uh, very important here, like uh, our expert mentioned. <laughs> if we delay and delay the case, then the society may not uh, even remember what was this all about, actually, and even if there is a good verdict nobody remembers. So we really should strengthen the judiciary uh, investigation. Uh, we should facilitate uh, speed. It's very important. At the same time, we should keep into mind that we do not want to uh, sentence and try persons on some vague evidence. Uh, we should be very careful here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Doritis. You touched upon very important issue that is about uh, lobbying law. Unfortunately, we do not have time for that today. Uh, like you said to those persons who have very big influence and however, I would like to use uh, what you have said in one uh, way when asking uh, our next speaker, all the books, uh, Mr. Books talking about uh, human resources, human resources quality. You already mentioned what has been done to increase uh, competency of judges and standards of ethics. Do you believe, do you think that these steps, these measures will lead to this key issue 
tas ir notiesājošiem spriedumiem. Tā tad spriedumiem, no kuriem rodas sajūta, ka taisnība ir uzvarējusi. Lūdzu, vārts jums. So, please, the floor is you. Es teiktu, ka tas ir tāds paralēlēts stāsts. Notiesājušie spriedumi arī uzlabos, arī zināmas darēs varbūt tiesu sistēmā strādājošo darba kvalitāti. Yes, conviction sentences will improve the quality of some of those who work in the judicial system because they still exist in the same reality as we are. We live together with them and whatever takes place in the society also affects them. So the conviction sentences will serve as, um, as examples of principal action. They will affect them and also encourage them because everyone is uh, just a human being. But what concerns uh, improving the capacity, uh, we believe that the judicial training center will improve the, uh, the capacity, including the judicial and prosecutorial capacity. Also our activities, uh, like increasing the remuneration to the maximum level allowed um, would contribute. Uh, unfortunately, we have to admit that this, uh, these wages are comparatively low still, but this is the maximum allowed by the law. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, if we compared uh, these wages with uh, wages in the sector, uh, this, these wages were just ridiculous, but now we managed to persuade the governmental partners to increase this, uh, these wages to the maximum level. And I hope uh, that uh, these um, amendments in the uh, official uh, remuneration law uh, mentioned by Mr. Dury, this will really um, help to improve the situation because in our interest, uh, it is to attract the best employees possible. Also, it was mentioned several times uh, that the uh, investigation quality could have been better. And in this regard, we uh, are sure that also thanks to our initiative and uh, the initial action already taken, I think uh, the, the um, proposal to create uh, the Internal Security Academy uh, is really on the table now, and it was mentioned already by, this, by several previous speakers, including the Prosecutor General. And so we have now a specific plan how we can uh, create this kind of body. So uh, there are also many other activities as well. But the main thing that I would like to say is uh, we need leaders, we need uh, those uh, who um, supervise us also to lead us uh, to serve as an example because this affects the entire sector, all the employees working in specific sectors. Maybe this will not be an accurate comparison, but four years ago I joined the Conservative Party and the main reason was the um, fight against corruption. And I really saw that we were on the same page and I saw that this political party has uh, people with the same mindset and who also are ready to take active action. And one of the reasons is because the corruption can exist in any sector and can affect uh, our everyday lives. And in my case, uh, I was really worried about regional roads that even after being repaired, uh, they are uh, in really a bad state of disrepair one year later. Just one example, the Latvian state roads, uh, when they uh, carry out the planned uh, road repairs, managed uh, to save money uh, during uh, procurement uh, procedures than they initially planned. I don't know whether this is due to being uh, uh, more honest or whatever, but I would like to link this uh, with uh, the example of uh, the example provided by the minister in charge of this sector, because this also affected the entire sector. So they managed to save money and use this money for repairing additional roads. What concerns a fight against corruption? 
I would also like to say that during the last year, we have heard about uh, sentences in cases that have been heard for quite a while. And I think this is also attributable to our cooperation with the judicial sector, also with the prosecutor's general office, and also with investigative bodies, that we have this common awareness uh, of the need to improve processes. Uh, also, we have the first case of the so-called digital gate, also Lemberg case, Maguan's case. I will not speak about the content of these sentences, but at least there is some progress uh, in the first instance. And then also, then there is a question about new cases and what is the quality of these new cases? I think uh, they all strive from whatever was done from the already deceased Jutta Street. And do we have new cases? And, and what is the capacity of CNAB and other law enforcement bodies to deliver these cases to the stage when they can be heard by the judge? This is what I wanted to say. During the last six months, we really saw specific results because uh, if we compare results with February, in February we spoke about plans, but now we have already the uh, operating uh, Court of Economic Affairs. The Judicial Training Center is also close to being completed. It's not just some idea somewhere in the air. It is a real uh, thing that is being implemented. And also thanks to the judicial audit, we uh, have uh, recommendations being imp implemented, including the matters mentioned by Mr. Kabalwala, like how to improve processes, because these were also problems found during the judicial audit. And they have been included in the action plan. And if I'm not mistaken, by the end of this year, we already have the real results. Thank you, Mr. Buksh. And now I would like to invite Mr. Strupish uh, to uh, participate in our panel discussion. Like Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, most probably judging by our, uh, by the result of this mini questionnaire, you saw that the signal that we give to the society, the message that we give to the society is by means of these sentences, because people want to see that those who are guilty are actually punished. In February, we already spoke about the fact that uh, such sentences can be made, uh, such uh, conviction sentences can be made uh, if the investigation and the, is of good quality and the prosecution is of good quality. And to continue this uh, discussion and also by referring to what Mr. Kabalwala said, it's very important that this is a two-way street that on one side we have good quality investigation and prosecution and it's easy for the judge to work but also the judges uh, can tell to the prosecution and the in, uh, investigation and also to the defense what could be the po potential problem questions where you have to look deeper and where you have to provide more justification so this two-way dialogue uh, maybe it takes place in Latvia, but maybe it still needs to be developed to ensure that all of these three stages can be improved. So what has happened in this context during the last six months, how this cooperation has moved forward and in your personal opinion, what can still be done? So where should I start about results maybe? A short comment, uh, I understand. I understand the public, the society, but as Mr. Rantan said, sometimes these expectations are based on uh, maybe exaggerated information, inaccurate information. Situations can be quite diverse, but the court bases its decision only on evidence. Um, maybe you have noticed many people are quick to judge. And if you are judged uh, uh, by anonymous uh, commentators, uh, that's one thing. But if you sit there in the courtroom, you have a, a concrete person in front of you, and then there is a totally different standard. A judge cannot uh, convict someone because the public demands that, but there is no evidence. Um, Ms. Chigana mentioned the excessiveness of uh, evidence. 
the evidentiary burden, excessive evidentiary burden. I agree that in some situations, uh, this burden can be excessive. But let's say if someone is recorded, uh, Mr. Ansans mentioned, you know, someone is recorded um, or filmed giving money, but uh, it's not really clear for what this money is given. This is a problem because situations can be quite diverse. For example, if this is only evidence, piece of evidence, then how can we bring this person to justice? Because we don't know why the money was given. Because in simple terms, corruption means uh, purchasing of illegal services. So you have to identify what kind of service is this corrupt person provided. And uh, until we identify this uh, service, so to say, this act of giving money can be classified maybe as uh, illegal proceeds from something, but uh, could not be classified as bribery. But then we may have also like circumstantial evidence uh, besides this direct evidence uh, of uh, this recording. And this, this creates huge problems in courts. Some time ago, a Latvian uh, judges were quite reticent in accepting these uh, circumstantial, uh, the circumstantial evidence. Yes, uh, the situation is slowly improving, but maybe we are not where we should be with the circumstantial, uh, with the circumstantial evidence. Yes, anecdote, I could, uh, but then it's like uh, this joke, you know, the victim has 30, has 32 pounds, but you cannot really prove uh, murder because you cannot uh, prove the intent that someone intended to kill. And this is absurd. How the judge should think? If everyone knows that if you stab someone, this person can die. And if you stab someone, you should realize that you are, you are killing someone. So this is intent. So maybe this, yes, maybe you cannot look into someone's head, but then there's also circumstantial evidence that should be taken into account. And to answer to the question, what we should uh, do and what has been done, we have prepared and already completed uh, two um, training courses uh, uh, on civil matters and administrative matters. I started this uh, program when I was uh, the chair of the civil chamber and uh, completed later, and uh, then it was adapted for the administrative uh, judges. And these uh, programs or these courses teach uh, how to hear a case methodologically correct from the very beginning to the very end, this algorithm, how the judge should proceed. Because uh, for 30 years or so, all judges uh, have trained themselves. They are not taught somewhere, and as they know, that's, they, that's how they adjudicate. Yes, there have been some courses, but they have been very fragmented, like they have learned one thing in one place, another thing in another place. And this explains why we have such a diversity in these approaches. And our idea was that we have to provide a common single methodology, and then it will be clearer for the society how the court operates. So if all the judges have the same algorithm, because there is one law uh, for, uh, for uh, all the people, then this would allow the court proceedings to be more understandable for the people. In civil and administrative cases, this has already been done. And now we have to adapt this program or adjust this program for the criminal cases, which is uh, maybe more complicated, but we'll start doing this uh, this soon. This is what we have done uh, during the last six months. What else? There was a, a clever man, uh, Cicero, lived in uh, 
the Rome, ancient Rome, more than 2,000 years ago. And he had this uh, great idea, the more laws you have, the less justice you have. And Romans knew about justice. They knew. We still have Roman laws. In family law, for example, in civil law, maybe we have to think about this. I know that the previous um, president uh, tried to bring this issue into his agenda, this over-regulation, because the corruption also stems from the fact that there are many unclear uh, laws uh, that that makes this water really uh, turbid and and that was that was brief comment i hope i answered the question mr strupish maybe a bit more about this possibility i think in essence you answered that you helped the judges uh, to work in a more professional in more streamlined way and this uh, this claims that many judges have taught themselves they have learned from doing but as you said methodologies are already available algorithms are already available and they would significantly ease their work and then I have this uh, question about methodology and methodological approach. And you have already covered administrative and civil cases. And now you are thinking also about the criminal law and criminal proceedings. Do you um, expect to have the feedback, uh, like uh, communication between the judge and the defense and the prosecution, if the judge, for example, sees uh, potential problems? Yes. The judge receives a case, uh, you know, how he prepares, uh, there should be like a checklist probably. Uh, so what issues should be considered to prepare uh, for the hearing? Then there is also a possibility to organize a um, preparatory hearing. And before the case has even start, uh, has been uh, heard, the judge can ask questions if something is not clear to both parties. And they still can, uh, these parties can uh, submit additional information so that everything is ready when the, mm, the hearing is started. And this is what Mr. Kabarwala already mentioned. You know, the judge asks, are, are you ready? And are you ready? And then you start the hearing. We have a similar system, but the judge can do that. Uh, why is this preparatory hearing? Solve whatever matters are not yet solved. But that is included in those methodologies. Thank you, thank you. This is a very important aspect that many of uh, the panelists uh, maybe didn't know that uh, there is this new algorithm, this methodology that includes uh, uh, aspects uh, explained by our U.S. experts about this preparedness. Uh, it's really important to have these clarifications. And now, with your permission, we will move to the uh, prosecutorial part, and I invite Evita Masule to join our um, discussion, prosecutor of the Division for Coordination of the Corruption Combating Criminal Justice Department of the Prosecutor's General Office. If I understand correctly, then this department is the response of the prosecutor, prosecutor's office uh, to the claims that there should be a better coordination uh, uh, in these uh, difficult corruption cases, and you have been established, and maybe then you can uh, tell what has happened since our previous discussion in February, how this work has become more efficient. Hello. We are newly established. Uh, 
there are some technical problems. I don't know whether. Uh, so everyone has a bad quality of sound of Mrs. Masula. So maybe you can switch off uh, the camera and it will provide for better sound. Is it better now? Yes. Taking on to consideration that our division has changed its name. We have also changed our functions. Sorry, no. Unfortunately, we have problems uh, to hear you because, but your uh, message is very, very important. We would like to hear that. Uh, maybe you have a possibility to connect to another internet or device or whatever. I'll try. If you need some time, I can now give the floor to uh, Mrs. Valgere from Internal Security Bureau concerning improvements in investigation. And then we will have a step back and talk about uh, the prosecutor, because like I said, we really want to hear every single word you want to uh, tell us. Uh, are you okay with that? Yes, I will try uh, to make a connection on another device, but now I will give the floor uh, to Mrs. Valga. Hello, dear participants, listeners. Internal Security Bureau has a duty to disclose and prevent uh, criminal offenses that have been committed by employees of uh, uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs. Uh, and so, therefore, the Bureau believes uh, to, uh, that it's a, a duty for the Bureau to uh, implement uh, that the law is working. And that is what we already discussed in the February discussion about participation of society, about the investigation quality and internal control system. And these will actually be the questions I will touch upon in my uh, story. In uh, this year, we have started 13 criminal proceedings for prosecution. Uh, we have sent 19 new uh, cases. And so we now have to thank uh, one of the prosecutor's office. Uh, we are very happy about the uh, increased capacity of this office. Right now, we have tried in total 22 criminal proceeding, uh, proceedings and seven criminal proceedings. Uh, there are also uh, two, uh, uh, two verdicts which have gone through whole instances so there is uh, also the decision about uh, refusing to uh, appeal uh, and uh, in investigate the case by accusation order then we have uh, nine police officers uh, convicted uh, other officials uh, and uh, several sentences have been given uh, the length of investigation uh, was on average 10 months since initiation of uh, the criminal proceedings until coming into force uh, of the judgment, uh, three years. One criminal proceedings lasted for one year and three months. We are very happy about the, this tendency. Right now in the proceedings, we have 36 criminal proceedings. Uh, in 26, we have already court sessions appointed. Uh, six of them are in economic court. And that is about numbers. But our opinion has not changed. 
we want to talk about the causes and preventions and to relate that we said the possibility of the company to uh, react of the institution to react we want to talk about the possibility the capacity to react to be a step ahead of this so-called criminal to uh develop the competencies uh, expertise that could help in investigation uh, knowledge of investigators we are talking about the classical bribe about the possibility to disclose that to discover that these are those questions and challenges uh, that have been actualized in the last uh, years of conference a lot of participants were there taking into consideration that prevention of corruption actually includes a wide variety of issues our bureau I can talk about three uh, cases to increase efficient cooperation between the institutions under supervision of the Ministry of Internal internal affairs to strengthen the role of our bureau which is based on knowledge and the ability to prove and also the causes of corruption and awareness of corruption here we talk more or less about uh, examination and research of latent criminality then i would like to speak about internal control system also referring to speakers of the first part also to mr ransons i would like to say that one of the most important preventive measures is uh, the task included in the action plan of the ministry of internal affairs we have started to implement this task and now we are in the final stage we are assessing the progress made for uh, the risk evaluation quality so we evaluated internal control system of uh, the institutions under supervision of internal ministry of internal affairs we are not ready to talk about the results yet but that is really what we have achieved this year and i can only say uh, that there is different opinion of assessment in the internal resource institutions but what we are aiming at is internal control system which is internal issue for every institution but we look for unified approach <clears throat> i already mentioned a bit about the quality of investigation however here we look first of all on the capacity of investigation of knowledge of investigators we had 14 training courses and cycles in this year concerning evidence criminal procedural questions arrested property uh, we also have uh, um, a control point from data extraction for credit institutions that is a very important achievement and uh, another system we have implemented then cooperation with the new prosecutor's office that is really a positive way in the right direction to achieve uh, results we have close cooperation we have unified requirements and capacity to react thanks to this close cooperation so that's why we are lucky today with that I would like also to mention 
communication with the Ministry of Internal Affairs, it has improved during the last, uh, within the last year, because the Ministry is reacting to uh, our alarms, like uh, risks for procurement and so. And finally, I would like to say that our further challenge is, is to land, land and land again. I can say nothing new about that. And uh, to see these challenges that are related with the five, fifth anniversary uh, of existing of Brio, because the challenges are different. Uh, and but then we have to wait for judgment in the 26 criminal proceedings, which I mentioned already in order to improve our uh, competencies and uh, knowledge. Thanks, Diana, that you invited uh, me to participate. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Uh, thank you, um, Mrs. Valger. You already mentioned the very important issue, uh, inter-resources uh, cooperation. But uh, concerning these uh, 14 training cycles you had for employees, uh, did you also integrate the court in uh, these uh, training cycles when investigating issues uh, where you integrating the elements of prosecutors uh, in order to uh, understand in which context your employee acts. Yes, I maybe was not so clear in those training cycles. We were learning ourselves, but in the conference of September, that was directed towards causes because uh, up till now we were reacting to consequences, not to causes. That's why this conference was very important to us, where we touched upon violence prevention issues, uh, cases on the borders, but that is not the theme of today's discussion. But also the, the, this was for, it was especially for our uh, sphere. Thank you. Thank you. So now I would like once again to invite uh, Mrs. Masule. We hope that uh, everything is fine with your sound. You already heard a uh, uh, positive evaluation from Mrs. Valger concerning this uh, qualitative contribution uh, she feels from uh, your activities. Now we give the floor to you, but unfortunately, we cannot hear you again. We were really expecting your presentation, looking forward to it. Also, without mm, camera, we can't hear you. So from our side, there is a, a suggestion, maybe we can exchange our views on what we heard. And uh, really, I could ask Mrs. Uh, Masule to write uh, at least theses in our conversation and then I would read these theses and I would ask uh, the participants of the discussion to comment on that. Uh, Mrs. Masule, uh, is it acceptable to you? I'm really, really sorry that technically it is not possible to see and hear you. I hope that uh, this offer is acceptable to Mrs. Masule, uh, but uh, now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Strupish and Mr. Ransons to talk a bit about this burden of proof. 
because you had very interesting uh, conversation in our chat where you exchanged uh, your uh, understandings what is acceptable uh, what is not and others uh, could also comment on that maybe you start first mrs rupish and then Mr. Ranzers, uh, no, uh, Mr. Ranzers written that in every matter we have different evidence and I completely agree to that. And it's very rare when you can uh, take one separate evidence and prove guilt on 100%, that is not possible. The case, the matter is built on the uh, causal relation between all evidence. Uh, you can gather on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ransan. From my side, I um, wrote these comments just to reflect that uh, sometimes when the court uh, reviews uh, evidence sometimes this video recording is not uh, sufficient you know if a, a body comes forward with this evidence and then it's uh, filtered by the prosecution it's it's not only it's not possible that there is only one piece of evidence so we don't have any dispute with mr strupish about this matter it was just a reflection because you know, to have these special investigative actions that are controlled uh, by the judge or an investigative judge, there should be already enough evidence. So, when the uh, court has, uh, when the case has arrived at the court, I don't think uh, there are these uh, fine minute details that could cause problems. Mr. Strupesh agrees with this. Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, no one would claim that someone is not in the recording, so we see that this person is there. So it's not like we uh, have to do forensic uh, uh, forensic test to make sure that the person who has been uh, recorded is really that person and wait for another year and a half. Uh, but sometimes, yes, uh, these absurd claims are made. Maybe this is due to the practice that was in... Uh, Wide, quite wide, widespread during the 90s and uh, the early 2000s, you know, people said, this is not me in the video recording and you don't have this uh, forensic invest uh, examination of the voice recording and the picture recording, then this evidence is not sufficient. I think we will gradually move away from these excuses. But maybe the prosecutor's office can uh, provide some commentary on uh, where we are at the moment, what is the current state of play. But sometimes these claims were uh, were just ridiculous. But we, uh, with Mr. Strupesh, have uh, no dispute uh, where we should go and what and what we should do. So maybe we can try with Miss Masul once more. Maybe she can join in. Uh, maybe the computer has become more friendly. Things that probably not. Uh, no, it seems to work fine. What I wanted to say at the beginning is that this coordination function that we uh, have uh, as a new function, its purpose is to improve the qualifications and knowledge of prosecutors and investigators. And we have to be open uh, towards uh, our colleagues and towards the other side. Uh, so when uh, we take this coordinating role in specific problem matters, we try to find uh, solutions to these problems and maybe also compile information on various problems that occur during various stages and not only uh, in Riga, but in various regions, because in regions these problems tend to differ. So we also try to understand what are the range of problems that we face during various uh, stages, like investigation stage and prosecutorial stage, as to the sufficiency of evidence. There should be this two-way street 
I hope that this problem will become less severe uh, because we had training where investigators, judges and prosecutors participated and they solved uh, problem questions. And sometimes uh, the parties have not been really forthcoming and sometimes people have even claimed, you know, why should we solve this now? When it actually happens, we will do that. But these uh, solutions should be um, thought over before, in particular in corruption cases, which are quite complicated. Um, in particular, also when we speak about uh, various uh, corruption cases, which are never identical, uh, also at various levels, like lower level police officers and maybe police management. And also when we look at the case law, it's very difficult to understand what she's saying due to uh, sound question, uh, sound problems. Uh, but uh, judging by the court uh, cases, it's quite difficult to um, substantiate why one or uh, the other approach should be adopted. And thus, this two-way street, two-way uh, information flow is very important. Thus, thus as the new Prosecutor General has raised uh, the stakes, I think we will try to uh, educate ourselves or try to uh, become more professionally able and uh, qualified. And what concerns corruption cases, of course you can think uh, and, and plan, but the actual situation in the field uh, is quite different. And then we also have to speak about to what extent the public is ready to uh, get involved in um, fight in the fight against corruption. Often you know that the witness has more information than he or she provides in his testimony. But often we see that uh, the police uh, investigators do not really want to press on, invest on, on the witnesses uh, to uh, not to undermine the good uh, rapport that they have established with the witnesses. Or I have seen that uh, there is this uh, willingness uh, or unwillingness, so to say, step out of the box and just refer everything to the court. I think the uh, position of the evidence is also related related uh, to uh, preventing the, the absurd attempt, attempt of the defense uh, to come forward with just ridiculous claims or objections. Maybe we also have to think about criteria that would allow to establish that the evidence uh, is sufficient. And when the judge, judge can say that no more evidence is needed, well, I'm sorry, says Ms. Chigana, but uh, we heard, we again have uh, sound problems and uh, we had some very important ideas, but now uh, we have lost you again. It was really unfortunate that we could not hear everything you said, but we heard some very important uh, ideas, like about this two-way street, uh, um, cooperation between judges and uh, defense uh, and also the readiness of the society to get engaged. And this uh, makes us return to the initial ideas, to what extent the society, the public is ready to engage if they uh, believe that this engagement will be meaningful. And now very briefly, I would like to engage uh, our panelists. We have several uh, Yes, members of the parliament uh, who have followed this discussion. I see Mr. Yeselnik, Mr. Gaydans, maybe from the point of view of the parliament, they would like to offer some comments and uh, tell what uh, the parliament as a legislator as an important place uh, that uh, implements or that realizes the public interest could do. 
Mr. Gaidans or Mr. Isalniks, who of you would like to provide comments? I saw Ms. Shuplinska as well here uh, some time ago, but maybe uh, she uh, has uh, disconnected. I would like to speak. Uh, good, uh, good evening. I would like to speak about the political will because we can speak about judicial processes and about conviction, uh, convictionary sentences. But if we don't have this environment that would prevent uh, the civil officials from even wanting to uh, commit any crimes, then we will fight only consequences. I would like to remind you about the history because since uh, 1990s, uh, the political the politicians of Latvia have not really tried to. Uh, limit uh, or, or create this uh, environment uh, so that the officials would not have to violate or breach laws. Uh, Knaab was established in 2001 due to the pressure from the European Union and we had to uh, meet certain requirements uh, to join the EU. This office was required as a precondition and then there was great oppositions, opposition uh, to the so-called zero declaration, if you remember, if you uh, maybe you will recall this uh, historical milestone as well. And then the annual income declarations are very important if we speak about officials. Unfortunately, there seems to be some problems again. If we look into the future, and the speaker disappeared again. Mr. Gaidans, unfortunately, we cannot hear as the uh, technologies are not really cooperate to, are not really ready to cooperate with us because we heard you quite well at the beginning and now we do not hear you anymore. Unfortunately, we have to finish soon because everyone counts on uh, us ending on time. And uh, comment uh, either from Mr. Iesalniks or uh, uh, from someone else who would like to provide a contribution at the end of uh, this discussion. If I may, at the end, I would like to return uh, to, uh, with, uh, to, with what we began this discussion, the uh, perception of corruption. What, um, what worries me, and I think the public is also quite concerned, I, uh, we see that, for example, in other countries, in France, uh, the previous president was uh, convicted uh, for a corruption crime. And in some other countries, we also quite regularly see is that high-level officials uh, are brought to justice uh, prime ministers, uh, ministers, uh, former or current, but in Latvia, I don't think we have ever had such a case. We had uh, one uh, mayor convicted uh, the first uh, instance, I think the former president of the bank, of one bank. There was a criminal case, but high level officials, I like very high level officials, I don't think any uh, have been convicted. And I do not believe that our higher level politics uh, is more honest than, uh, than in other countries. So from the point of view of say, um, public perception, this is a problem because at the same time, we hear about the so-called construction cartel where the former uh, pr president uh, politician was uh, mentioned, uh, was, invited uh, to Knab to provide evidence as well as other high level officials and they are not found guilty. Uh, they are not, uh, uh, their image has uh, uh, not been undermined in any way because, but at the same time uh, of late uh, during the last years, I think there is no case where this cartel has not controlled the price. So this is a very nihilistic approach also in the society, like, you know, if these fraudsters, high-level fraudsters are not uh, punished, why should I? Why should I not, uh, like, buy a, a fake COVID certificate 
or give five euros or 10 euros to secure the decision I want. And that's why we have this nihilistic environment because we see that no one at high level is ever prosecuted and convicted. Yes, of course, we can always find objective hmm, criteria, you know, claims that investigation quality is, uh, is not good and and uh, you know many uh, mentioned that it was a mistake uh, uh, to, um, to discontinue the operation of the police academy and so on and there are always excuses but the public still sees the result you know irrespective of these real or maybe uh, alleged uh, objective uh, objective excuses thank you mr yeselniks you actually ended with what we started during the uh, survey that we conducted. It was concluded that the moment when the public starts believing in the fight, in real fight against this uh, against corruption, will be the moment when we will have these conviction sentences. And I believe that our discussion was centered around. Uh, the trust of the society, uh, which is based on the uh, judicial activities, but uh, quality uh, sentences are not possible without proper investigation, without proper prosecution, without proper training, as we discussed. So we have many things we should take along that we uh, learned today. And uh, maybe we will continue working with these ideas and continue speaking uh, also uh, about them only uh, also when the new corruption perception index will be published. And then the society will tell to what extent it is, it is ready to believe that the corruption, uh, that the fight against corruption takes place in Latvia. And maybe these results will not be positive because we have been affected by many negative emotions uh, caused by the pandemics. But I think one of the good examples and good conclusions that we have made is that this cooperation between various bodies, these very important stages like investigation, prosecution and adjudication has really improved. And then we have these tangible steps, tangible results like improvement of uh, upskilling of the judges to ensure uh, that proper messages are given to both sides and also um, that this two-way street uh, information flow takes place. And by this, I would like to finish our discussion and would like to say huge thank you to all the panelists. And I would like to apologize if due to technical reasons, someone was not possible, uh, someone was not given an opportunity to um, speak, uh, but I'm sure that this is not the last meeting or not, not the last discussion organized by Dalna um, about these uh, topics. Huge thank you to Dalna uh, for this possibility to to participate and speak about these very important matters that are so that are so important for the development of our country thank you and have a nice evening